Good afternoon. Welcome to a Friday afternoon, very cosy live stream here at Grace Westminster. We are all snuggled up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're going to be doing an homage to the Nikon Rangefinders, and we have Grey with us today. Yay! Should have like um, applause effects on this thing. We haven't quite figured out how to. Well, do we have it. a soundboard there, so we do. We do. We don't know which one is the applause though. Ooh, the next live stream is going to be amazing. <laughs> Once we figured out which ones do which. Um, yes, today we are going to be talking about the Rangefinders. We thought after taking a little week hiatus for the easter holidays we'd come back with a bang and uh give you all the all the inside info on the history of nikon rangefinders it looks like some of you have never used a rangefinder before so you might find this one quite interesting um baxter has already sent us some questions all which right. i think okay. are going to preempt some of the questions i was going to ask yeah um but uh but anyway so i will get to those i won't forget baxter if i have forgotten just copy and paste them a bit later because sometimes they disappear off the chat as it refreshes um if you haven't already please give the stream a like if you're not a subscriber then you won't be able to comment on the on the live chat so do subscribe so that you can do that um and welcome to all our new subscribers as well we're almost at eighteen and a half thousand now yeah definitely if you haven't subscribed yet then let's just hit this eighteen and a half thousand target that would be nice wouldn't it to do that during the live stream um so, and we've got some pictures to share as well. So we're going to multitask as best possible. You're going to monitor the comments. Yes. So you're going to do the comments I'm bit. I'm a moderator. And I'm going to try and do the the fancy this bit. It's not a democracy. <laughs> it's I choose the questions. You do. <laughs> okay, good. So um, first up. Yep. Gray, font mm. of all knowledge. Wow. <laughs> so we were talking a little bit before the live stream about... Mm how the rangefinders came about because initially as many of our viewers will hopefully know nikon were a lens manufacturer right uh yes they did in fact um they were quite well known in fact the first canon hansa rangefinder cameras because canon didn't have their own optical setup you'll see that they have nikon lenses right yes them. yeah in fact for those some of you will have bought perhaps the Nikon 100th anniversary book by Uli Kosh and uh, in it, it he has some of those early Nikon slash Canon lenses he does yeah 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 that's right so they um, they were famous for doing that uh, they also uh, made a lot of uh, devices for surveying uh, then of course uh, the outbreak of the war mm. Um, they got pulled into um, helping the um, Imperial Navy mm -hmm. and Air Force with all sorts of things, periscope sighting devices and and um, uh, everything you can imagine. I, I think at one point they had something like 18 factories wow. with tens of thousands of staff. Oh, my goodness. Incredible. And that was just all for optical devices. Optical devices, yeah. Wow. That's right. Um, so I think a few of a few of our viewers will know the the story about David Douglas Duncan, the yes. the, the the late but great, <laughs> and uh, yeah, absolutely. And I would I would love just for those who haven't heard it, I'd love to hear how he kind of put Nikon on the map because you'd be amazed at what he accomplished. Yes, um, well. Uh, Duncan was um, uh, over in the Far East and um, he was doing something for, I, for Life magazine, mm. from what I recall. And um, he was in his, um, he was hanging out in his studio. Yeah. And his stringer, um, a remarkable photographer called Yun Mickey, mm -hmm. came in and took a picture of him. And he said, that'll never come out. It's too dark in here. And the following day... Um, uh, Mickey San turned up and gave him this large print, uh, this this study of um, um, Mr. Duncan yeah. uh, there, and Duncan was so astonished at the quality, and he said, "What are you using?" And he said, "I'm using Nikkor lenses that are made by a company called Nippon Kogaku, which was the original name of the uh, Nikon Corporation, yeah. which was founded in 1917." And um, so he invited Duncan to go down to their factory and he chose three Nikkor lenses with Leica screw mount fittings 
to put on his own Leica cameras and went off and shot the Korean conflict. Wow. And um, uh, back in the States, um, the magazine wondered if he was using a whole plate camera because of the quality. Yeah. And, um, and that started it off really because um, as the reputation of the organisation and what they could accomplish with their optics began to grow, more and more uh, photojournalists that were heading out um, uh, there started buying them. And um, right. a very famous or infamous, if you're a Zeiss, uh, article appeared in the New York Times uh, by Jacob Dacian, who said that uh, this, uh, these lenses made by this um, fairly unknown Japanese manufacturer were superior to the German optics of the Zeiss. <laughs> Shots fired right there. <laughs> and, uh, and at that point, the head of uh, Zeiss said, unless you retract this, I'm removing all our advertising. Oh, my goodness. And um, they didn't uh, uh, retract. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he thought it was a terrible plot, that it was impossible for the Japanese to come up with something. And um, so, uh, you know, Duncan, who was like a poet with a camera, really, yeah. um, uh, he um, he was responsible for introducing Nikon to the West. Yeah. And um, when I first went to Japan many years ago as a guest of the president, I was up in his um, rather grand office and um, on the wall was this fabulously large photograph of Picasso outside his residence. And Duncan at that time was living in France, the south of France, and there's a rainbow going over, of course. Of course. Going, <laughs> Picasso's smiling outside. Wow. He and Duncan were very close friends. And it was hand-inscribed to the president. And the president looked at me and said, um, Duncan-san is the greatest unpaid PR man we've ever had. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? I mean, I think to myself, when I look at the amount of influence he must have had to have used just three lenses while shooting, three Nikon lenses, and then to find reporters all over the world using lenses because he used them. That's, That's right. Such an influence. Yes, and he um, he was he was always in the in they seemed to be in the right place at the right time. In fact, he was on the USS Missouri when there was the formal surrender of uh, Japan mm. in front of uh, General MacArthur. He was on and took pictures. Um, at uh, at that time, and um, so you had a defeated nation, yeah. And um, they had to do something about um, things. The factories had closed down, and Nikon, for example, were not allowed to make anything that would have a warlike mm. use. And uh, so they were told, you need to do something that will bring in much needed. Um, foreign investment. Yes. And um, so because they'd been making uh, optics, I suppose it wasn't too much of a jump for them to consider a camera. Yeah. They came up with two ideas. Mm. The first, which if you pop it up on the screen. I'll show what we've got here. Let me just, there we go. So, so this is the first idea, which I don't think many of our viewers will have seen. It's, necessarily. Yes. it's quite a rarity. I love the simplicity of this blueprint as well. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, the, it's the Nikoflex, which is a twin lens reflex. And um, I think if they'd gone ahead and devoted themselves to that, I don't think there would ever have been a Grays of Westminster. Wow. Mm. Because the other thing that they did was a 35 millimeter rangefinder camera, mm -hmm. which we now know as the Nikon One, but in those far off days, um, which was March 1948, um, it uh, uh, was just called the Nikon. Right, and we have a picture. We actually have one, but let me just... Uh, yes, that did actually work. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. always good when so I know smooth. what I'm doing. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, so, so there it is. This is actually an incredible shot taken by Tony Hurst. For those of you who have seen the front cover of this live stream, that is also a Tony image, uh, which we'll also share a little bit later. Um, but these images by him are just pure artistry, if you ask me. Yes, um, absolutely. 
And this, so the Nikon, as it was called at the time, later mm. called the Nikon One, was not was not full frame. No, it was twenty four by thirty two, and um, uh, the the problem with it is they realised that um, uh, that they couldn't export it to the US, which was the the big market. Mm -hmm. That's where they wanted to. to yes, um, um, uh, because. The format was so small it would mess up the Kodachrome mounting machines. Yeah. So 400 cameras were, um, were delivered and the remainder were uh, modified mm. to widen the film gate mm. to 24 by 34. Right. Um, and what so they did... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the reason for that being is they couldn't just adjust it to uh, 24 by 36, but they could make eight holes perforations mm. instead of seven. Right. And that would be enough to actually cut the frames. Oh, I see. In between the frames. So they could then actually use it. Interesting. See. He did some research. He, he speaks sooth. <laughs> <laughs> Done my homework. Yeah. And um, what they did was with these Nikon ones that they modified, they just got a stamp and stamped the letter M. So if you see very early ones, they're slightly out of true. They're a bit askew. They are a bit askew. Now, we've got one here. This, I imagine, is a late one because the M is very beautifully aligned on the top. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? I think it is. It is. Yeah, I think this, this is... This has actually one. got its original box with it. Oh, well. my nice. God. Nice. Yes. So we've got this one on display downstairs. One thing I will say is in the... the reason One of the reasons why it's taken us so long to put this live stream together <laughs> is every time we manage to obtain... Uh, an SP and an S2 and an S3, and we managed to have one of everything, we sell them. <laughs> so, so we don't have an S2 with us today because we had one and we sold it, I think, on Tuesday, which means uh, we are devoid of an S2, but we do have a picture, so it's okay. Yeah. We have this one. So yeah. you won't necessarily be able to see the serial number, but the M is up there. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the reason they used the M was the... Leica size was 24 by 36 mm -hmm. and then bought out a 24 by 32. So they thought they'd go halfway and call it the M. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Four. Yes, you do. I mean, that's a weighty camera. It is. Well, it, it is a it's heavy really, camera. It's really, really chunky. Yeah. Um, I actually, if you put on my um, desk there, not the camera that's closer to you, but the one just behind in the bubble wrap. Yeah. So one of our friends of the shop... Mark brought this in for me to look at the other day and has loaned it to me for the sake of showing it on the live stream. Um, but when you were talking about the, the Nikko flex, yeah. he was telling me how at, at one point there were, there were probably TLRs for every letter of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably why if Nikon had gone with a TLR, then we wouldn't have this incredible legacy that we have now. Yeah, that's right. Um, but this is an... I, I assume that it's pronounced Aries as opposed to Air. I could be wrong. Um, let me just open... You, you open the lens cap like this. But this is a really rare one because actually it has Nik Nippon Kugaku lenses on it. And there were very few of them made. It was um, made shortly after the war when Nikon had laid off a lot of their staff because mm -hmm. post-war efforts they had to but this is a thing of beauty i'm not allowed to put a roll of film through it sadly but <laughs> you can have a look at it and it is really really gorgeous and in lovely condition and i think later on they put oh i've gone blank now they put another brand of uh lens on but anyway so there were very few made with the with the nickel lenses on mm. there so mm. there's a little bit of uh history it's probably just as well that nikon didn't decide to do a tlr that's right yeah. after all that so after we had do we have any questions before i well they say the chat is very quiet because everyone's listening to gray right now yeah we're just avidly listening oh, right. <laughs> no, no pressure, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> um thank you very much to fred for your contribution to the coffee thank fund we did yes. not announce but coffees are always welcome thank you fred so thank very you much. for that and thank you to jean as well Thanks, for your Jean. contribution yes, to the coffee thank fund you. and um and hello to seth who would like a z mount rangefinder which would oh. be quite an interesting idea, wouldn't it? They never did it with the SLR. I mean, obviously. <laughs> but it would be interesting to see a Z1. It would be possible. Yeah, you know I think so. Fuji have, um, what is it, the X100 
that's that's a rangefinder but style. A, yeah, that's a point and shoot. Yeah. With a built in lens. It is, it's true. But but what I'm thinking is like because obviously it has its own mount. Yeah. So why Nikon, let's say, if they design a digital camera with the same mount? That would be interesting. That would be interesting. But then you'd have then these lenses would uh shoot up in price. <laughs> I mean they're already pretty expensive because there's not that many of them around. But yeah. It's it's true. I don't know if it would necessarily be very helpful. Like a mount? It's a great, it's a great <laughs> no, idea. <laughs> yeah. Z mount is quite large, though, for this type of rangefinder. Then I think it would just make camera quite large. Yeah, it would. It's true. That is a it is chunky, isn't it? That. So after they did the the Nikon one, and then they had the later version, which had the M stamped in it. So it was modified, so it had a slightly yes. wider frame. What did they do next? The S. Which, yes. which was pretty much the same, except it had flash sync. I think I have that one. Let me just show you that one. There we go. So that's the S. This is a stunning image that I have never seen before by Tony Hurst. Um, Beautiful shot. Isn't it incredible? So this is the S. And and was that full frame yet, that one? No. No, also no. not. No, it was, just, it was still the same. So it was 24 34, but first to offer flash synchronization. Right. And that was the only difference between mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so that one came out when? Well, that's a good question because I didn't note it down, but I'm just <laughs> going to look in my... Your red book. My little red, well-thumbed <laughs> book, which I've had for many, many years with all my scrubbly notes in it. Oh, I've got the gray. It says the M was dropped uh, from serial numbers in April 1951. So I assume that would so be a that production would be start. S yeah. 51 to. Yeah, January 51. Right. So January 51 to then 55. We actually do the one just before. I missed this picture, but this is the this is the M, which was then discontinued. Oh, you, yeah, I should show that with the yeah. live magazine shot. Yeah. It's a gorgeous. It's a great shot. He's a remarkable photographer, Tony. Absolutely. Hurst, isn't he? <laughs> he really is. So, so it was Nikon. The Nikon, or Nikon 1 as we know yeah. it, then the M, yeah. then the S, S. Mm -hmm. which is over here, which is this one, and then in 1955, was it? What, for the S2? Yeah. Uh, 54. 54, mm -hmm. we had the S2, so there we go. So that was, this is an ad uh, for the S2. Mm -hmm. I don't actually, where, did, where was this ad, I wonder, where they included it? Um, I imagine it was in Popular Photography or something like mm. that, one of the American journals. That's where I've usually been able to track down these old ads by buying them online. Yeah. And um, now the S2 was the first break into 24 by 36, full frame 35 mil. Finally. <laughs> first with a lever wind. Oh, yes. First with international shutter speeds from one to a thousandth. Right. Whereas all the others are one to five hundredth. Um, Gosh. So, um, and uh, they made a lot of them. Yeah. They made two versions, that, the all chrome one, and they made one where they made the dials black. Right. And that's still the, our most popular selling one in the S2 range. So our S2 that we had up until the beginning of this week, as we were preparing for this live yeah. stream, um, that was a black dial S2, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so we do see those around. I can understand why it would be popular because uh, there's another shot there of the S2 um, with its very fetching leather case. Mm. And I think that the 500th of a second shutter speed would have been quite limiting for a lot of people, actually. Mm. So it makes sense that this one would have been more powerful. Um <laughs> oh, old a higher angler spotted on the ad. It says it's too small for me to read the thumbnail. It mm. says, please, it says on the bottom of the page, please say you saw it in modern. So assumingly, right. <laughs> so that was the the magazine. Um, so then we have the uh, Roy. Uh, someone asked a question, and Roy's actually answered, but said, were any of the Nikon's made in brass? These are brass cameras, aren't they? Sure. They're very heavy, mm. so you can really tell. And when they wear out, this one is actually in remarkable condition considering how old it is, but when they wear down, you actually see the brass underneath the, underneath the plated uh, The patina. Coating. Yeah, it's very lovely. So, so that was the S2. Um, and then they... So I'm just going to go back to us for a second so you can see our faces. So after the S2 didn't come the S3. 
No. Just just to confuse everyone. No. <laughs> now, the, the, the next one we had was the SP. Right. And the P stood for professional. Uh-huh. Um, Not casual. Titanium <laughs> shutter. Sorry. Uh, adapted for motor drive with the S36. And it had dial-in switchable frame lines in different colours visible in the viewfinder. Right. So this is our SP over here, isn't it? Yeah. Actually, we managed to keep this one. This is about to go on the website, but we decided to just keep it so that we'd still have it for the live stream because we've sold two in the time that we've been preparing for this. Um, so this is what the SP looks like. It's much lighter, I have mm. to say. It is a, it is still a hefty camera, but it's much lighter than the, the Nikon one. Yeah. And you can see on the top there, you've got the sort of the options to dial in the different lenses on the top. Um, the the it's got two viewfinders. Yes, because the smaller one to the left is for twenty eight mil. So you've got this little one on the side here, which is for twenty eight, and then the one on the right hand side is the one that you can dial your fifty, your eighty five, your one o five, or your one three five, or they did them in centimeters, so it says five, eight point five, ten point five, etc. Um, and you know, just to interrupt you mm. for a moment. That they then went on to make 180, 250, 500, and 1000 mil 6.3 with a reflex housing. <laughs> the 1000 mil weighed 22 pounds. Oh my goodness. I mean, what would you use that for? Good question. Ballast for a submarine? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, um, I've never seen one. I've Have you not? Never seen the 1000 no. mil. That's amazing. They make such a lovely sound as well. Yeah. Um, so Champagne Sumo asks, how much does the SP cost? It does vary. Yeah. They're usually well, about... One like this, about 1950 Yeah, about about 2,000 pounds roughly. Um, in... It will increase more if, if, for example, it has its box and case, original instructions, or perhaps its warranty cards, which way back then were hand-signed. Wow. Isn't that incredible? Mm. A little extra touch there as well this one's in very nice condition but oh, it's, you know it's, it's really nice it's yeah. considering how old it is it's been not too too heavily used were there versions of the sp that had a cloth shutter or were they all titanium? early ones had cloth yeah. right so if you're ever looking out for one then you might see some of the early ones have a cloth shutter and then later ones will have a titanium shutter um we have a couple oh, of sorry, sorry just one ahead. other thing i'd forgotten to mention yeah it was the first camera to take a clip-on exposure meter Oh, and Nikon made one of those. Yeah, yeah, which coupled up to here. Oh, that's very cool. Mm. I th we've, I don't think, I don't know if we've got one, but we've had. Not at the moment. We've had a few over the years. Are they know. still reliable? Do you think? Well, it's a selenium cell, so um, <laughs> um, probably highly unlikely. Mm. <laughs> so maybe a separate handheld meter would be a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. For that one. Do we have some coffee funds? I've yeah, seen them ping through. We've got Marvel Thomas. Thank we've you, Marvel. Adrian Cochrane. Thank you, Adrian. And Chris Angel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do you know I've known Adrian? For decades, yeah. he, he, I used to serve him at a camera shop I worked in in, in Dorset. So, afternoon, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> go go back a long, long way. We do, yeah. Did Adrian go to Japan with you? He did. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, we had a um, we had a couple of weeks where we took, um, I think, about fifteen or sixteen of our customers all around Japan, and um, Nikon put on the most fabulous trip for us. In fact, um, every day was something different, and I got taken to one side by um, a chap called Richard Long, who's an old customer of ours, and he said, I wish to complain. You told me this was a photographic trip. In fact, what it is, it's a gourmet <laughs> lover's trip with a chance to take a few snaps. <laughs> but it was... I wouldn't be complaining. It was. <laughs> uh, it was remarkable. We went to the factory... Um, we got a lovely tour of the factory and... Um, Is that the factory that no longer exists? Yes, that's right. Sendai. Yeah, wow. Uh, Adrian says, good afternoon, great. Yes, a great trip. There you go. Um, so I will show this picture of the SP whilst, we, whilst we're still on the topic. So that is, again, another Tony Hurst image. Is that a black SP? I can't actually see it. It is. Yes. Yeah. Wow. With the 1.1. With the 1.1, which we actually have. So they did two versions of the 1.1. Yes, they did this one, which is the internal mount one, internal bayonet. And um, it was felt at the time that uh, perhaps it put 
too much weight on the mount, mm. mm -hmm. um, I haven't ever seen any problems uh, with it. So after a while, they then made this one, the external mount. Um, the internal mount came out in 1956, and they made 1,200 of these. And this one came out in 58, and they made 1,800. Wow. Uh, they are very scarce. Yes. We've only seen probably no more than five in the last 36 years. And I've shot with this one. Have actually. you? Yes, I have. And it is, it's a stunning lens. It's actually something that I've never seen any other lens do that this lens does and that it kind of draws the, draws the subject out so completely from the background. Mm. You get this kind of really beautiful swirly whirly bokeh, mm. um, <laughs> which you'd, you'd quite like actually. So yeah. take notes. <laughs> yeah, we've just been testing Voigtland F1 lens. And for, we, for the Z. For the Z mount, and it does a very similar thing, but yeah. I haven't tried that one yet. No. Now, the interesting thing, the, there is one up on the auction, lights auction, uh -huh. uh, in Leica M39 mount. Yeah, I saw that. And that one is very rare. We found it in the Uli Koch book. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the P is for professional and SP. Champagne yeah. Sumo asked what the S stands for. Does it stand for super? Does well, the, be super professional. Well, they, they use the S from the first flash, flash sync model onwards. Uh, S. So it was S, S2, mm. SP, S3, S4. And then it all kind of lost, it lost all meaning at that point. But <laughs> yeah. But maybe originally it stood for sync. Potentially. I think so. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's one of those questions where you get a lot of different opinions. Yeah. But um, we shouldn't really forget in all this that there was someone in charge of the design of these early models. Yes. Uh, um, Mr. Fukita. Which I, who, whom, of whom I have a picture. There we go. Yeah. We have a, we have a sort there of one of those is. official ones. And he was... He doesn't particularly look at here, but he was a very jovial character. No, it's very <laughs> serious. <laughs> and um, um, Robert Rotoloni, who has written a number of books on Nikon rangefinders and runs the Nikon Historical Society, interviewed him in some depth to ask a lot of questions that um, had come from collectors and and sort of photo historians that they wanted to know about and uh, his knowledge was extraordinary even going back to those far off days wow amazing so he was the the designer um ken says that he purchased an s2 uh on ebay recently hmm. and the camera looks and performs as brand new and has taken some of his best black and white photos oh, with it yeah. um rangefinders someone asked how you focus with the rangefinder in fact days off said how's the focusing on the sp is it only done through the front wheel or on the lens it's Done on the front wheel until unless you're using one of these, yes. uh, and the, the little wheel is not sufficiently robust enough, so you would turn it by the focusing by hand. Um, but normally, it's the the little flywheel thing here. Yeah. So this is this is the wheel that engages the the focusing. Now I will say, it's much easier than some other rangefinders where you're trying to focus. Your hand is in the front of the camera. You can't quite see what you're doing and you're trying to, to also do this. So this is a is much more ergonomic in terms of but the position of the of the release is quite far back in comparison to mm. other cameras. So you just have to get used to that element of it. Um but yeah, essentially what you're doing is you're looking through one or the other of these viewfinders and you're trying to line up the patch in the middle so that your subject is lined up with the patch and then you know that it's in yeah. focus. Yeah. One would hope. <laughs> so, uh, so that was the SP, and then, and then they brought out the S3. Uh, that's right. Yes, the S3 um, it was um, in a, in a way it was a kind of a stripped down SP. Mm. It still took a motor drive, but it didn't have the switchable frames. It had bright line finders um, in, in the uh, in the viewfinder, and everything else it looked the same but it didn't have that lovely long glass window that you've got here mm. and um, this one is although a lot of these cameras appear to look the same that the SP 
uh, really sticks out because of the window there and the fact that the name is over on the far side mm. right. rather than than just in the um, just in the center there um, yeah, so that was 58 to 61, That's the uh, S3. This is ours. Uh, there we go. I'll put it back onto that. So 58 to 61. Okay, so now we're starting to encroach on Nikon F territory. Well, no, the S3. Is that oh, the S3? You... I think, yeah, that's the S3. Oh, right. There, yes. Good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So 58 to 61. And um, yes, because it was just nudging, uh, if you like. Um, and probably still fulfilling orders because the Nikon F was released in the in the middle of 1959. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it kind of overlapped a little bit. Um, and it's interesting that they went from this design to an SLR. I wonder if that was because other companies were starting to bring out SLRs. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And Nikon thought, oh, we better yeah. start moving. So, so you've got the S3, which is, as you say, a stripped down... Uh, SP, mm. and then right at the end they brought out um, the S4. That's right. Right. So this Which is the one that's actually on our cover. It's Which sharply one? reduced, um, no self-timer, no motor drive, and um, in fact never exported uh, out of Japan that I'm aware of. Um, the big market, as we discussed earlier was in North America and mm -hmm. the big um, Nikon importer was a gentleman called Joseph Ehrenreich and um, he refused it because he thought it would interfere with sales of the, the Nikon F and maybe take away sales from the SP mm. and um, so they're not that easy to find uh, really. And they're not terribly expensive either, but they're they're great. They're beautifully made. Yeah, and they're more sort of more recent, if you like, than the others. Yeah. So they made those. What were the dates on the S four? S four March fifty nine, July sixty. Less oh, than wow. a year. Oh wow! Gosh, they really didn't didn't produce them no. for very long at all. Well, I think the minute they knew they couldn't export it. They thought the game is over. Yeah, really, so. mm. yeah, absolutely. And the SP and the S3, did those come out side, sort of side by side? Did they run those side by side? Sorry, the SP and the S3. Well, or did it, they it, discontinue the SP? SP was fifty-seven to sixty-five, mm. and the S3 was fifty-eight to sixty-one. Oh, okay. So they did it for a shorter window than the SP. The SP lasted yeah longer. Yes, I because I, I think a lot of um, pros at the time or serious amateurs um you know had their sps and they also had f's as they were gravitating towards this new um remarkable slr which took the world by storm mm. Mm. yeah it really did um and then last up they had the s3m oh yes yeah so we can't forget the s3m no, that's, yes, that is the S3M. Just checking, I put the Yes, we've right. got one. Yeah, we've actually, we didn't bring it up because we have this um, fabulous picture of it, but uh, but we actually do have one on our shelf. So uh, the div what was the difference between this and the normal S3? Well, this was half frame. Mm -hmm. So it was 18 by uh, 24, wow. and it enabled you to take 72 images on a 36 exposure roll of film and it had its motor drive, which was the S72, so framing up to 72 exposures. Yeah. Um, but only 195 units were made. It is wow. probably the rarest of the production models uh, of the rangefinder and their last great hurrah. Yeah. Wow. And Incredible. I think up until very recently... We thought that this was the only half frame we did. camera that Nikon had ever made. But those of you who watched the live stream a few weeks back will know that we discovered, um, and I'm going to share this picture again, but we discovered that Nikon actually made this in very limited run. This was an FM2N or um, half frame. And the only way you could tell it was half frame was by taking the body cap off <laughs> and looking That's inside. Right. Yes, it was ordered by um, the Norwegian Nikon importer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because someone in the Norwegian 
police had the bright idea of film economy because they wanted to take mug shots. And um, so they, they asked Nikon whether they could make some that were half frame. Um, the Nikon Norwegian importer put in an order and Nikon, um, you know, took the regular FM2 before it became the FM2N. So it was not 250 flash exposure. Right. Uh, flash so it was an FM2, not an N. And they modified the film gate and um, uh, they made a um, they made a number and then the, the people that were doing this extra work, it was so time consuming and so expensive to make <laughs> that uh, the, the, uh, Nikon just decided they weren't going to do anymore. So only 34 were ever produced. 29 of them got shipped um, to various um, Norwegian police authorities. Four of them went to um, school photographers and one at least ended up in a Norwegian camera shop and this one is where Tony Hurst bought his and this beautiful picture that he took of yeah, it. Yeah, you know. it is really stunning. Um, I've never seen one in the flesh. No, no. Uh, and as you said, we didn't know that it existed until Tony sent over the picture and we thought, That's right. what is this camera? Because the box for it just says FM2. Yeah, so you would be in complete mystery. Yes. <laughs> you take for your, for your camera dealer to have accidentally yeah. given you that one off the shelf. Not in any brochure, not in any history. No. Um, Young June asks, uh, may I ask the differences between the 50s original SP and S3 and the reproduced models of the 2000s? Because we have had some of those limited oh, millennium editions. Yes. Well, um, what they tended to do was um, uh, the, the, the 50mm lenses, um, they copied the uh, what was known as the Olympic mount 50mm lenses. Mm -hmm. um, they're pretty much identical. They're, they're beautifully made. In fact... The leather covering, someone at the factory found in an old warehouse that they still had reams of the leather oh, wow. uh, that they'd used on the original camera. So when they wanted to do it, they the great thing about the Japanese is that um, they have huge respect for um, older people. Mm -hmm. And so they asked um, any of their old retired engineers to come back in that had worked on them. Wow. Um, to kind of help guide these younger executives or these young engineers and designers through them. And they, for the millennium, they bought out the S3 mm -hmm. in chrome. And um, then I think the next one they did a, an SP. Yeah, SP. With a 35.18 lens. L limited, was that what it was called? Limited. The SP Limited, yeah. right. And they, um, they also did a black S3. Right. Yes. I haven't seen so many of those, though. Yeah, you don't. No. no. <laughs> um, expensive. <laughs> they uh, are. Yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder how many they did of that limited edition run. I think we probably have the write-up of it somewhere. Yeah, I think the certainly the S3 Olympic, I believe, the very first one they did for the Millennium, I think they made 2,000 in all. Wow. 2000 for the year 2000. That's e yeah. easy to remember. Yeah. Um, well, if any of you out there have one of those beautiful cameras, let us know in the comments. Lucky you. Yeah, lucky, lucky you. Uh, we did have some stock. I remember when we when I first started working here. Wasn't that <laughs> wasn't that long after the millennium? I suppose. <laughs> I wish I would have the money at the time to buy one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so. That was back in 2008, was it? We yeah. started here. Yeah. So we still had a couple. I think, lurking in the, yeah. in the back there. Well, we got approached by Nikon to buy the remaining stocks in Europe and right. we bought them all. Mm. Well, that was very good of us. <laughs> we kept one. <laughs> yes, we're fountains of charity. <laughs> That's right. Um, to answer Richard's question, Richard said, do the 2000 uh, special editions sell for more than the originals? Uh well, Depends on the condition. Yeah, exactly. That That's the point. Um I mean, we had one gentleman whose name I won't mention who came in one day and uh, uh, he ordered three S3s. And I said to him, why do you want three? And he said, well, I want one to take 
pictures with. I'm one, one on the shelf and the other one, because I love engineering, I want to take it to bits to see how they made it. Then it will all be in a bag and I'm not going to put it back together. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I would I would want to take it apart and then put it back together. Not that I'd necessarily do a very good job, but um, that's kind of sad. <laughs> you think that there's a, an S3 somewhere in pieces. It's all in a plastic yeah. bag. You know, it reminds me of uh, one member of the staff who's no longer working here, mm. but uh, he took iPhone apart and never put it back together. Really? Yeah, he couldn't find enough screws. <laughs> I'm trying to think who that was. I'll ask you afterwards. Um, it's uh, Marcus K. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to Gary for your contribution to the Coffee Fan. He said he missed the start, so he'll watch it in full later. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Thank you. Drew referred to us as the Three Musketeers and said uh, Gray's knowledge of Nikon is outstanding. I could listen to him all day. Oh, how kind of you. They, Thank you yeah. for the tribute. Michael asks a very specific question. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this. I certainly can't. He says, how did they overcome the problem of parallax affecting the composing of final image, especially on close-ups? I don't know what we were talking about when that question came through. No, I think it's just general just range generally finder question. In range finders. Because obviously the framing, what you see, is generally not what you get on the shot. No. So... So how would you... Does the frame move if you start to close focus to a subject? On these? Yeah. No, okay. No. So I don't know. Is the so I guess you just have to use the camera and then learn. <laughs> and then maybe yeah. That's right. shoot super yeah. close. But also yeah. the closest focusing distance on many of these is not going to be um, as close as you get with modern cameras and lenses. Three feet yeah. is on this 50 So it's a what, 90 centimetres? So they, did, they did do a micro nickel. They did. Which they we did have downstairs. 55, didn't mm. they? Or 5.5, yeah. um, three, three, a 5.5 centimeter, 3.5, mm. uh, which is interesting. And I wonder how that worked. Did it come with its own viewfinder or did it just, no. it went on and you just no. prayed? Most of the viewfinders um, were, the most popular ones are the universal ones. So yeah. that you would buy that for say, you know, an S or something like that. And um, we could just, dial it in they mm -hmm. did have a little lever at the at the back so if you knew you were on infinity or you knew you were at 10 feet you could do that and it would adjust it up and down to try and oh, okay. get, get you a, a proper sort of parallax correction interesting oh that's cool yeah i, I think it was pro you know you, you'd get there through experience yeah oh. did they do an external um, range finder that you could put on the hot shoe for certain lenses no 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 they did a range finder illuminator to brighten up the screen Ooh. the interesting Quite thing useful. is <laughs> yeah actually, definitely these take better pictures now than they did when <laughs> back then because the emulsions are so superior Much more forgiving i would say mm -hmm. probably and yeah. have more more kind of flexibility and latitude than they did that's what i the wanted. latitude's the word yeah. isn't it yeah <laughs> um they did do a a very i'm good i was gonna say very focal but that's not <laughs> the word they did a variable viewfinder attachment did they not i don't know for which camera but was there not a little accessory that would allow you to i'm sure we i've seen it somewhere that had for example 105 and 135 built into it just, just those two? I don't know if it was just those two. I'm just no, that was the very frame. It was the very frame. Yeah. And it was it an attachment that went on the other rangefinders? Which one was it, it for? It, well, it, it would be on the ones that didn't have those. Didn't have bright line finders. Right, so everything mm. except for the SP yeah. and the later mm -hmm. ones. Right, I'm with you. Because I have seen it. There's there's a host of little accessories that we have downstairs for these yeah. cameras. And, and they did independent ones. So if you had a 135, there's a slim little cylinder for the just body. for the 135 just, yeah. i suppose if you're doing a lot of portraiture that could be quite useful yeah, definitely yeah. yeah um thank you to terry for your contribution you, to terry. the coffee fund very very much appreciated thank you terry uh, did we thank gary as well we did thank gary thank you gary again um now uh, David said, please do a giveaway uh, of a week's use of an S range finder and a 51.1. <laughs> you'd have to be in the UK. You can come into the shop and try one and then you'd have to put it back on the shelves. But uh, but you can do that anytime. We do have them in the store and uh, on display for sure. Uh, did I miss any other questions so Baxter asked a question earlier which I don't think is going to show up anymore um and he was it was a question that I was kind of thinking of do you think that the Nikon F coming out 
was the reason why they stopped rangefinders ultimately, or was it just the kind of the trend, the way that things were going, a little bit like we see now, I suppose? Well, uh, yes, I mean, it, it could have, you could say that it killed off the rangefinders, but that, that was a sort of a natural progression. The, the effect on the market was explosive. Mm. And within a very, very short spirit, a period of time, nearly every pro photographer working uh, had a Nikon F. Right. Because you had motor drives, you had bulk film backs, mm -hmm. you had interchangeable focusing screens, interchangeable finders. Yeah. It was the start of a stunning system. Yeah. And... We know Nikon Fs are still in use today. Yes. Um, so many years later. And I think as a 35mm camera, I think it is to look at it, particularly with the pyramid shape um, that um, um, was designed so cleverly, um, really uh, makes it really stand out mm. because most of the prisms were rounded. Yes, yeah, they were at that time, weren't they? Yeah. I remember when uh, Goto San, Tetsuro Goto, who we have up on the wall there, you can't see, um, when he came, the last trip that he did to the UK, yeah. he gave a talk to the Nikon owner subscribers, and uh, he showed very early br blueprints of the first concept for the Nikon F. Mm. And it looked like an entirely different camera. Yeah. To what, and I'm very glad that they went with what they went with. Yeah. But it was it was very boxy looking. It was completely different. And I think that they even built, and I they probably scrapped it, but they built a prototype and had photographers use it. And they, they'd done this sort of meeting and they had people come yeah. and use it and say, no, don't like this, change this, change that. And then they scrapped it and started pretty much from scratch. Right. In fact, there are some examples of those prototypes at the Nikon Museum in right. Tokyo. Which we we need to go to one day. Yeah. <laughs> we must get you two over there, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Colin asks a good question. He says, where can you get these cameras serviced these days? I have an S and an S2 that could both do with a service. Well, um, we know a man. Mm, we do. Yeah. Um, we will, um, if you contact us, um, we can uh, email Becky or myself and um, um, we'll... Um, we'll pass it, pass on the details. Yeah, absolutely, because there it is still possible to um, to service these, and in fact, um, he's very passionate about rangefinder, Nikon rangefinders specifically. So yes, and he's uh, done quite a few of ours. Yeah, that's right. Um, Baxter asks, how big a market share did Nikon have of the rangefinder market versus Leica, Leica pre Nikon F? Good um, question. I don't know the answer to that. No, I mean. They made. They were making rangefinders essentially for. I'm thinking 1948 to when did when was the S4 or the SP was discontinued in '65, so they were making them for about 12 years. I, you would think that with with the amount of production that the SP had, they were doing pretty well oh, for themselves. Yes, and um, you know. There was that sort of period during um, the war mm. um, when, in fact, um, the Leicas that they were making, um, people grabbed the patents and started making copies mm. right. based on their brain, like the Reed camera with the Taylor Hobson lenses. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Um, so I wouldn't be able to say for sure because I wasn't there at the time, yeah. Baxter, to know. Well, <laughs> Leica M3 was released in 1954, right. so I guess it would directly compete with Nikon rangefinders. Yes, I, I have spoken over the years to a number of um, very distinguished Leica service technicians, and they always tell me off the record that the SP is better made. Mm. <laughs> I know that's blasphemy. And it is probably to a few. There's like someone it. with a grey Levitt doll sticking pins in it that's a Leica <laughs> fanatic. I can already see the comments. Yeah. yeah. Exploding. <laughs> no, I have a great admiration for Leica. It's yeah. extraordinarily beautifully made. And uh, the fact that they're still making them is a testament mm. to their perseverance and quality control. Absolutely. But it's interesting that a technician would say that. Yeah. Knowing the literally the insides of the cameras. Mm. Uh, that is very, very interesting. Christabel asks, what's the um what's what Nikon rangefinder do you consider the best? SP. So 
I would probably have to agree with you on that, but mm. I've only ever used the SP, so I don't have a huge, uh, I don't have a huge wealth of experience on the others. I would be interested in trying an S3 for the simple reason that mm. it's just a stripped down version of the SP. But I think the SP is is superb, and uh, you know, if I was going to buy one, it would be that one. Mm. Um, Galadian, uh, Galadian. Apologies for not pronouncing your name correctly. Said the most the most beautiful Nikon rangefinder model ever made. Your opinions? So this is aesthetics rather than usability. Um, that's tough. Gosh, um, that's that's a difficult question. I I mean, in a way, I ooh, I I would say, if I was looking at Tony Hurst pictures of them, I would say the, the Nikon Model One. Yes. Mm. And the SP. And I don't know, I mean, if you're one of the old lags who's followed these streams in the past, the, the reason it was called the Nikon, because the company wasn't called Nikon at the time. No. It was called Nippon Kagaku. So they took the NI for Nippon, which means Japan, and the KO from Kagaku, which means optical, and they created uh, Nikko and added an N on the end. And so this is what we... That's how the name was created. So it was called the Nikon. And later, Nippon Kagaku was such a mouthful to get through. You know, <laughs> voices, they, they, uh, the, the company uh, changed their name fully to, to Nikon. They thought, Nikon, that'll do. <laughs> that rolls off the tongue, two syllables, and it's nice and easy. Um, so we ended our poll. Mm. What were the results? Well, two-thirds of the, our YouTube population said... Yes, for digital rangefinder. Mm. And 32% said no. Interesting. So those 67%, we're doing a kickstart. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're not doing a kickstarter. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it is interesting to see how many people like that. You know, they still love that retro design and would still want Nikon to do something that's modern but has the, the retro mm. built in. It is, yeah. it, there is definitely something iconic about it. Um, Have you got that picture of mr duncan i think i do yes let me that that was this one with his yeah um, with his nikon f yeah. and uh, one of his nikon rangefinders um this is a photograph by our good friend um joe mcnally and um uh, joe went down and interviewed him a couple of years before his death but in advance of the 100th anniversary of the formation of the nikon uh, company mm. and uh, he went down to the south of France um, to interview him and um, there he is and um, two two greats really in that room between Joe yeah. McNally mm. and David Douglas yeah Douglas. and uh, Joe told me this story that um, when um, um, he was covering something for I think he was working for life and um he had to cover um, President Nixon. Mm. And um, when uh, Nixon was making this appearance, um, David Douglas Duncan was in the audience and he was trying to get to speak to President Nixon and the security people were keeping him back. And as he went past, Duncan yelled out Nix, um, uh, President Nixon's military number Oh, wow. And Nixon stopped. And, of course, they'd both been together in the same regiment mm. and had got caught on an island trying to escape the Japanese. Oh, my goodness. And uh, there was a bond there. And Nixon spun round and saw Duncan and was overwhelmed and grabbed hold of him and they had a picture taken together. And Nixon's holding up one of uh, uh, Duncan's books and they got Joe to shoot it. Mm. And um, the next day, Duncan rang up and said, I'd like a copy, and he sent it off to him. All those years later, when he went down to the south of France, Duncan went to a cabinet, took out the picture and said, Joe, would you sign it for me? Oh, my goodness. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That is so beautiful, the fact that he remembered it all that time. Yeah. It was... It, it was mm. some, considering he's someone that's probably had his picture taken quite a lot. Yes, yeah, so I'll see if I can just slip out of my chair. Yeah, absolutely. While you're having a look for that, um, we 
we will be concluding the wildlife challenge this week. So we've got how many entrants now? Oh, we've got over 150. Over 150. So that's going to keep our work cut out for us. Definitely. So. You'll be a um, tough time choosing the images to show you on so the stream. next week, that's what we're going to be yeah. doing. So. This is the book. This is the book. Um, it was Duncan's uh, last book. And um, inside... Uh, it was he uh, inscribed it uh, to me for our thirtieth anniversary. I'm immensely proud of it, mm. and um, uh, there we uh, there we have it. And there's one of these quotes on the back. It says, "I do not believe that there is another man, dead or alive, who has made more memorable pictures of war in all three of those major conflicts: World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War." He is a true romantic Vanity Fair. Wow, amazing. Yeah. Um, you can probably still pick up copies of that somewhere. I would, I would, I would, I would think so, yeah. Um, and, um, and if you like this t Tony Hurst work, he's in every issue of Nikonona magazine. That is um, correct. Which is um, well worthy of your attention. That's right. We have. Do you have a copy of the um, Tony Hurst book? The Grey is Tony Hurst book yeah, as well. I do. You're, sorry, you're closest to the bookshelf. <laughs> I should have been a bit more prepared. Um, but we did, for uh, for the 100th anniversary, we did actually have this stunning book of Tony Hurst images made. And, I mean, I'll just show you a small sample. There's a sneak peek for you. Um, we do still have a few copies of these, don't we? We, uh, we do, yes. Yeah, so you can buy it on our website. Um, and they're signed and numbered. They're signed and numbered, so limited run. Um, and Introduced by Gillian. And introdu uh, intro it's a beautiful introduction written by Gillian Greenwood, who also is the features editor of Nick on Owner. Those Nick on Owner subscribers will know as her introduction there um and as you said there is always a tony hurst image in nikonona magazine pretty much every issue isn't there it is every issue the yeah. tony hurst gallery there you go um any other questions before we wrap up where we may purchase those magazines and books oh there you go so you can go onto our website the link is in the description box if you want to subscribe to nikonona there is a special link in there for you to do that and um if you if you go onto the Grey's Westminster website, we actually have a bookshop section there, which has all the books and everything in it. We don't have the David Douglas Duncan book, but we do have lots of other Nikon related books. Uh, yes, there you go. Do we still have Mr. Rotolonia's book on rangefinders? No, it's because out of print. It's out of print. Um, I was talking to Becky about this yesterday. I'm going to see if there are some somebody who's got some remaining copies mm. in the UK because I think the only copies are with Mr. Rotoloni in the States, but it's a magnum opus. It is, mm, uh, really it is. Indeed. the um, culmination of a life's work and well worth investing in it. Um, but it would be too expensive to have them shipped from the States. Mm. Yeah, but uh, if you are US-based, you might have some success finding finding it. Yes. Um, there we go. I think that's everything. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been lovely, fascinating. Thank you so much to Gray. Well, thank, thank you, Gray, for joining me. us. Thank it, you, Con. It's been an education. Um, you're welcome to always put your comments on the stream after it's ended. If you're not watching it live, you can always put your comments and questions. We will try to answer any that we can. As I said, next week we will be doing the wildlife competition not competition, challenge, roundup. Uh, so we will be going through 150 odd images of yours. Sounds like it's going to be about three or four hour live stream. <laughs> I think we're going to have to do a sort of selection of them. So if, uh, yeah, so bear with us on that. Um, and otherwise we're back to normal next week. We have a Nikon report. Back on schedule. And I have a video coming out this weekend. And uh, yeah, and that's everything. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend all. Bye-bye.